<laughs> My name is Andrew Devaney. I'm originally from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Probably the first person you ever met from there, right? <laughs> uh, I recently got married in June. My wife, Veronica, is sitting here in the front. So give her a round of applause, right? And, and like Felix said, I'm the founder and CEO of a nonprofit organization called As One Ministries. And we exist to transform the whole person through sustainable development. And currently, we're serving in Uganda. <clears throat> but As One, hey, there we go. She's excited. Uh, <clears throat> but really, our, our, our beginning came from an understanding of what poverty is. And I believe that oftentimes, poverty is misdiagnosed and misunderstood. And it's oftentimes understood as just a lack of material things. But I believe that poverty is a much more evil force that attacks the very core of a human being, marring their dignity, ripping away their true identity. And so at its core, I believe that poverty is spiritual and its nature is relational. And so we as human beings have a broken relationship with our Creator, thus marring our true identity and our true vocation or purpose. And we live out of that marred identity and we have broken relationships with our brothers and sisters. We have broken relationships with our neighbor. And this creates ongoing systems of broken relationships that all of us find ourselves participants in. And out of this view of what poverty is, we as one have a belief that development is just not enough, but we believe in something called transformational development. And the twin goal of transformational development is changed people with a, with a restored sense of identity and vocation, a restored sense of identity as being made in the image of God and being made as children of God. And that this actually unlocks something. It unlocks a purpose. It unlocks a vocation that we were created to be contributors, co-laborers with God in the renewal of all things, in the restoration of our communities, in the cultivation of vibrant and sustainable communities. And the other goal is that we would have just and peaceful relationships in our communities, that we would see things flourish as the way in which God intended them to be. And so oftentimes I get the question, so what does that really look like then? <clears throat> and to me, it looks like um, we have this project which we call the Amaka, which means home in Luganda. And this home serves as a transitional home for women who are coming out of prostitution, exploitation, vulnerable, vulnerable women. And there's a gal whose name is Salama. And so I believe that this looks like this gal who leaves the work of prostitution, who leaves the work of exploitation. And she was a Muslim, and now she's baptized. And she's saying that poverty is not my identity. Exploitation is not my identity. Oppression is not my identity, but my identity is in Jesus Christ. And... And she's running, or she is the president of her high school at 34 years old, hoping to graduate high school and hoping to go on to become a nurse or a teacher. To me, this is a picture of what it looks like to see the kingdom of heaven come here on earth. Are you with me this morning? So today I get the privilege to talk to you on Mission Sunday. And I believe that mission is a very important word when it comes to our understanding of who God is. And mission goes straight to the very heart of God and to the very nature 
of his church. I believe that mission is not a sideline activity. It is not for those who are passive. It's not for those who want to live in the past. It's also not for those who want to make their own name great. It's not for those who want to play it safe. And it's not even for those who just want to be good enough. And though it may be risky, and though it may disrupt the status quo, it may get you into trouble and it may even cause you heartache. I believe that mission is what God is all about. And I believe that the church is a community of image bearers. I've been listening to your sermons on identity. Uh, The church is a community of image bearers made in the Imago Dei who are made for the Missio Dei, which is the mission of God. And I believe the church is called to define itself, to organize its life around, and to live its purpose as being agents of God's mission to the world. Restoration. I believe that God did not create a mission for his church, but created his church for his mission. And so today my hope is to inspire you into God's heart for this world and to share with you my story about how he opened up my life to the world that he loves most. Um, So I'm going to ask you to join me in Revelation chapter 21. And as we go there, I just want to pray. I want to pray for this time. I want to pray over the scripture. I want to pray for our hearts. So Holy Spirit, we just ask you to come. And every itch and every longing And every desire that we have, may it not rest until it rests in you alone, Lord. Until it rests in seeing your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, Lord, do what only you can do in our hearts and in our lives and in this community. We ask for more of you. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Revelation 21. John on the island of Patmos writes this in chains most likely as he gets a picture of God's future world. God's future dream for humanity. And here he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. In the Hebrew text in Genesis, the sea or the waters represents chaos and disorder. And John says it's not going to be there any longer. And he said, I saw a holy city and a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. Uh, Listen, and he says, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. You want to say that with me? I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God. And they will be my children. Can I get an amen? Amen. 
I believe the moral arc of the universe is long, but it is bent towards justice. And it is bent towards God making all things new. From a garden to a city. From broken relationship with our Creator to a restored one. From violence to justice. From pain to joy. From hatred to reconciliation. From poverty to where everyone has exactly what they need. This is the way in which God intended the world to be. And this, my friends, is where history is headed. I love the way Paul writes. He says, For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, in Christ. And through him he is reconciling himself all things, whether on earth or whether things in heaven, by making peace, shalom, wholeness, through his blood, shed on the cross. N.T. Wright, theologian, says that Jesus' resurrection was the beginning of God's new project not to snatch people away from earth into heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. That, after all, is what the Lord's Prayer is all about. People who believe in the resurrection in God making a whole new world in which everything will be set right at last. These people are unstoppably motivated to work for that new world in the present. And so that's what I believe. This is God's vision. And I believe that God's vision is for image bearers like you and like me to be active participants in making this world filled with his justice and his righteousness. Taking his future world and making it a present reality. Here and now on earth as it is in heaven. And so I want to tell you a little bit about my story and about how God woke me up. To the vastness of suffering and poverty in this world. So when I was in college, uh, I traveled to Rwanda, uh, spent a summer there. Rwanda is this beautiful country located in East Africa. They call it the land of a thousand hills. And it's lush, and it's green, and there's beautiful dancing, and beautiful people, and wonderful food. <clears throat> and while I was there, I began to fall in love with it. But I began to learn about a dark history that took place in Rwanda. And for a, over a long period of time, there was hate between two tribal groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis. And by the, by the time 1994 came around, over a million people were killed in just three months. And over 75% of one tribal group was completely wiped out in the three months period of time. And I remember hearing stories of pastors tricking their parishioners into saying, hey, this is a safe haven. You can come and you can hide here. And then they would tell <clears throat> their clansmen, or those who were in their tribe that these people were hiding. And they would come in and there would be brutal murders. And they would cut off their limbs. People who were in the same church would go to each other's houses and murder their whole families. And what, what began to disturb me very much is when I learned that during this time, Rwanda was 80% Christian. Imagine. And so I began to ask myself, how does this happen? How does it happen where a country that is 80% Christian, where pastors and people who say they're brothers and sisters in Christ are actually murdering each other? Where people have a greater allegiance to a tribal group 
than to the lordship of Jesus. They have a greater allegiance to their tribe than to the kingdom of heaven. And it began to make me ask questions about my own upbringing in my own country. How do people have a greater allegiance to their race than they do to the kingdom of heaven? And how do people have a greater allegiance to their political party than to the rule and reign of Jesus Christ? And that should speak to all of our hearts. And I remember hearing a story between some pastors. And so this was a gathering of pastors in Rwanda after the genocide took place. And this man named Claude was leading the conversation. And he walked up and he said, there's about 55 pastors in this room over this beautiful sunrise morning in Rwanda. And he says, friends, most of you know me. You know that I'm the son of a preacher. And as a result, I grew up going to church all the time. Maybe even five times a week. And what may surprise you, though, is to learn that all of my childhood and all the church services I attended, I only heard one sermon. At this, eyes got larger. And people seemed curious and maybe confused. One sermon in all those years? He continued. That sermon went something like this. You're a sinner. You're going to hell. You need to repent and believe in Jesus. Jesus might come back today. And if he does, and you are not ready, you will burn in hell forever. And at that, almost everybody began to laugh. They weren't laughing at the idea of going to hell or the idea of believing in Jesus. They were laughing at the recognition that this was the only sermon they had ever heard too. Sunday after Sunday, year after year, different words, different Bible verses, but the same point. Then Claude got serious. And he said, when I got older, I realized that my entire life had been lived against the backdrop of genocide and violence. Poverty and corruption. Over a million people died in my country in a series of genocides that started in 1959. Nearly a million in Rwanda. And in spite of a huge amount of foreign aid, our people remain poor. And many of them hungry. This is the experience that we have all shared. And around the room, people lean forward, nodding their heads. So much death, so much hatred, distrust between tribes, so much poverty, suffering, corruption and injustice, and nothing had ever really changed. He said, eventually I realized something. I had never heard a sermon that addressed these realities. Did God only care about our souls going to heaven after we died? Were our hungry bellies unimportant to God? Was God unconcerned about our crying sons? and frightened daughters, our mothers hiding under beds, our fathers crouching by the windows, unable to sleep because of gunfire? Or did God send Jesus to teach us how to avoid genocide by learning to love each other, how to overcome tribalism and poverty by following his path, how to deal with injustice and corruption, how to make a better life here on earth? And he went on to say, Over the years, I have come to realize that something is wrong with the way that we understand Jesus in the good news. Something is missing in the version of Christianity that we received from the missionaries, which is the message we now preach ourselves. They told us how to go to heaven, but they left out an important detail. They didn't tell us how the will of God could be done on earth. We need to learn what the message of Jesus says to our situation here. And that is why we have come together. Contrary to popular belief, I believe that the central message of the kingdom of heaven was just not about how to get there, but how it could be done here. And so as a community of image bearers, if we were to define ourselves, to organize ourselves, to live our purpose around God's mission to the world, the way we would respond to death, to hatred, to violence, to to oppression, 
and then justice would actually be quite different. I also remember hearing stories of what I thought were glimpses of the kingdom. Glimpses of people who were willing to pull down God's future world and live it now in their present reality. There was a group of students. And this group of students, well, this was about a year after the Rwandan genocide took place. And these students had gathered for evening prayer. And they had finished saying things like the Lord pray, Lord's Prayer. And they had actually just finished learning about Martin Luther King Jr., and Gandhi, and Nelson Mandela. Very shortly after that, a Hutu rebel group broke in, and they began to say, Hutus over here and Tutsis over here. Hutus over here and Tutsis over here. And not one student moved. And so again, they said, Hutus over here and Tutsis over here. And then one of the students stepped forward and he said, we're all Rwandan. And that day, many of those students lost their life. But that day was also a picture of what it looks like when people who bear the image of God say, that future is what I am calling reality. God's future world is my present reality. And so my question today is, are there people who are willing to rise up and say that God's future world is my present reality? Because those who are made in the Imago Dei are meant to participate in the Missio Dei of God making all things new. And so we need courageous people who are willing to live by faith and say that God's future world is my present reality, here and now, on earth as it is in heaven. So to land the plane, the, I want to ask you guys, what does this mean? What does this mean for you? What does it mean for you and for you as people living in Denver, Aurora? What does it look like? And I want to use the scriptures as a way to guide you into this. So Matthew chapter 15, the story of a Canaanite woman. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. This is uh, Matthew 15, verse 21. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. He goes up north. And behold, a Canaanite woman from the region came out crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. Eugene Peterson says in the message, he ignored her. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. And finally, he looks at the lady and he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And he said, and she said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire and her daughter was healed instantly. So Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. And this word Canaanite would strike a chord with all of them. It would stand out very clearly. The word Canaan is the ancient name of the whole land before Abram arrived. The Canaanites were pagan and corrupt. Their presence in the land was a threat to the purity of Israel's religion and morality. So there is a long history of spiritual and military conflict between Israel and Canaan. 
David and his royal successors managed to control them. Solomon even did business with them while he was building the temple. Over the years, the Canaanites were defeated, and most of them fled the land. So this woman would have been quite rare. Just a note, Mark writes about a Syrophoenician woman. But Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, wants to be very clear. This is a Canaanite woman. So Jesus moved north to Tyre and Sidon. And one would have to say that he was not simply trying to get away from the problems he was facing in Israel. And neither was this a chance meeting with this woman. The Lord was going to this Canaanite area to meet this Canaanite woman. The timing was significant. At this point, the Jewish leaders, the lost sheep of Israel, were rejecting him. And a woman who hardly knew him was seeking his mercy. There is something very powerful in the social and the ethnic dimensions of this text. Her words are significant, given Matthew's description of her as a Canaanite. She was well aware of the ancient rivalry between Israel and Canaan. She believes that Jesus is the promised Messiah. And that means if that is true, then he is to her a Jewish king. Son of David, she cried. As such, he is sovereign over her and her land. And all she can do is cry for mercy. Her words open up these old wounds, but she was desperate for her daughter to be healed, so she cried for mercy to this Jewish king. And what is clear is that this woman was not going to give up, but kept pleading. And you have to see the contrast between this text. Jesus said he came for the lost sheep of Israel, and the Jewish leaders are rejecting him. He was trying to convince them that he was the Messiah. He, they were saying, prove it. Give us a sign. But this Gentile woman, this Syrophoenician woman, this Canaanite woman, she was convinced that he was the Messiah and she was not going to give up. And you begin to see the ways in which Jesus is testing her. So my invitation to you here is pay attention to how the inbreaking of God's future promises is going to enter this present reality. The word for dogs is a word for the Gentile people. It refers to these small dogs, perhaps children's pets. They're harmless and they're actually somewhat helpless. And she is accepting Israel's historical privilege over the Gentiles that God, through Abraham, was going to make Abraham's name, name great and going to be a blessing to all the nations. But she is no threat in her request for grace that this would be freely given to the Gentiles. The basic theme of this passage is Christ went into Gentile territory and did a miracle for a Gentile woman who had greater faith than the Jews who were rejecting him. This woman was bold enough to claim that God's blessing and God's promise was for all the nations. Not just for the lost sheep of Israel. So she said, I will even eat the crumbs that come from their mouth. Because salvation is for all of us. It is for all the world. And it is for all people. This is a very different story than what people in that day understood. And I believe that this woman is saying, God, your promise for all the nations to find salvation, I'm going to beg for it in the here and now. And so what about you? What about us? As we say, I believe in a world one day where there will be no more pain or crying. I believe in a world one day when people 
will not have a greater allegiance to their race than to the kingdom of heaven. I believe in a world one day where there, where there will not be poverty, where the poor will be able to be the agents of their own change. And so I'm going to take that promise and I'm going to say it can happen here and now on earth as it is in heaven. And sadly for many of us and for the church, sometimes we spend most of our time and energy and money working on our own home. And the greatest needs in the world are actually right around us. Homelessness, drug abuse, marred identity, lost sense of purpose. Poverty-stricken countries all around us. And so I'm wondering if we will move away as the church of Jesus Christ in North America from our consumption habits, from our desire to be entertained, from our desire for self-help, and if we will rise up and we will say God's will be done out there. And so I believe that the application to this is actually quite simple. You, my friends, are in a particular place each and every day, and I believe that God has placed you there. You're maybe at a school and maybe on a bus, maybe at a workplace, or maybe at a home, maybe at a church. And you have a certain amount of resources, money, energy, reason, attention, skill, a certain amount of property available to you, a certain amount of credentials that you've been given, a certain amount of influence, a certain amount of agency. And I believe that God is calling you to go into those places and be an image bearer and go and restore the places in which the image of God has been lost or corrupted or marred, or his absence, and create a world in which God looks at it and says, yes, that is very good. I challenge you to boldly confront injustice, to boldly confront idolatry wherever they are found, and to restore those who have been captive to their own sin and victims of injustice in this world, that that is what God is calling each of us to. I got a friend, his name, uh, I won't say, but he owns a, a car dealership back in Sioux Falls. And recently I've been trying to bug him to go to Uganda with me, and he said to me, Andrew, I believe that God has given me a mission through my car dealership you don't even understand. And he says, I, I don't even really want to share the stories with you because I don't want to take away from the possible blessing that will come from it. But he said, every single day or every single week, I have somebody come in and say, hey, I have $500 and I need a car. And he says, you know what, I'll make it work. And he has women who come in and they say, I have an eating disorder and my organs are shutting down. And he says, I don't have the money, but I'll commit $10,000 to making that happen, to, to sending you to rehab and to seeking healing for you. He's got people that get upset with him and angry with him because they feel like he gave them a bad deal. And he said, I will do whatever I can to make this situation better because I believe that's what Jesus would want for you. And he, he runs a car dealership, not a church. A car dealership. And he said to me, and I just thought this was most striking, for three years straight, I have not saved a dollar. But God has provided for everything that I've needed. And he says, I see things that I would never imagine. He said, I think my employee, employees are beginning to catch on because they think I'm crazy. But I believe that this is the world that God desires. And then there might be some of you in here that actually haven't caught God's heart for the nations, that haven't caught God's heart for the world. And maybe you, like Jesus, need to go up to Tyre and Sidon. Maybe you need to go to the ends of the world 
to the ends of the nations to see that God's heart is for all people. And so when we invite you to come to Uganda, God might just be calling you to go and to see his heart for the vastness of poverty, to see his heart for the poor, the orphan, the vulnerable, and the widow. So restoration. My invitation to you today is will you go out and will you be image bearers who are willing to be active participants in seeing God's future world present in the here and now on earth as it is in heaven. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we love you, and like we said earlier, do what only you can do. Do things in our lives that don't make sense. Call us to things that we would never ask or imagine. Let us believe the heart of your very prayer. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Holy Spirit, would you do a work in this community by empowering your saints, by empowering your people to be a light in this community, that they would see relationships restored, relationships reconciled, They would see people come to claim Jesus as their king and come to work for his kingdom here on earth. We ask that you would grant these things in Jesus' name.